Good morning, Life Center. Great to have you here with us today. And, and it just might be uh, what we're hoping to be the last online only service because next Sunday, uh, we're going to be back here together. So looking forward to that. Uh, at the end of today's message, stay tuned. I'm going to have some, some information to pass along to you to help you um, know what to do, how we're going to do it, but coming back together. So today is the fourth and final part of our Better Together series. And I'm excited because the timing works out perfectly. I'm talking about uh, growing together through community, which the community is our local church assembly. So we've spent the last few weeks, you know, we've been talking about this better together, coming against division and, and dealing with a lot of practical things and ways on how we just can become better together by focusing on the things that we are, have in common as opposed to all the things that divide us. But I believe it's, these messages have been so much more than practical. I honestly feel that when we launched this series, it was just God speaking to us, addressing um, just the condition of our world. The enemy has launched an attack of division in our, in our city, in our community, in our county, in our country, in the world. And, and I believe that what we're talking about is a direct counterattack against what Satan is doing. And so we're linking together. We're choosing to make a difference. We're choosing to be better together because that's what God has called us to do. And so we're at making a stand. Uh, Jesus referred to uh, us as salt and light. Salt obviously changes the flavor. Light brightens the darkness. Those are all change agents. And that's what you and I are actually called to be and to do. And so that's what we've been talking about in this point of talking about being better together. There's a reason, there's a motive, and there's a spirit behind what God is doing to help us to understand that. So I hope that this has been encouraging to you, challenging to you, and I hope it's inspired you to know that you are not alone. So keep doing what God has called you to do. Keep being the change that you know our world needs. So today we're gonna, we're gonna look at being better together through community. So uh, I, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you've joined us. And I'm glad that we are about to dig into uh, a powerful, powerful tool that God has designed to help us spread the gospel and be closer to Christ through the local church, the local community. So let's talk about the importance of our local church, our local community. I believe that it plays a very critical role in keeping the body of Christ, and, and just to explain that the body of Christ are Christ followers that make up the church, that is in scripture referred to as the body of Christ. So the, the local church, the local assembly, it, it, it plays a very important role in keeping that body nurtured and strengthened and healthy. And, and if you remember, we've been talking the past few weeks, we've been talking about the three things in being intentional, being missional, and being relational. And so I wanna just show you the continuity that happens when we live this way and we have small groups that are centered around it and then what happens in the local community. So in the context of small groups, we're being intentional by growing and cultivating connections. We talked about how you can find a common interest and, and build a small group around that common interest. And just because you're doing that, you're building connection, you're being intentional. And in the missional part, we talked about how that it always points to Jesus. Whatever it is, it always points to Jesus and ultimately to the gospel. And of course, the third is relational you invest in others and it grows a relationship that is that is the thing that tears down the walls and opens up the heart for someone to make that next step in following Jesus. So that's what small groups do. The church does the same thing on a little bit larger of a scale and that is we're intentional, the church is, by creating a place of hope. That's what the church is should be known for and it should be a place where people of whatever race, creed, or color, nationality, uh, whatever their role in life is, this should be a place of hope. That's intentional. We want it to be that way. And of course, missional. This is the place where you hear the gospel. This is the place that's focused on pointing people to Jesus. And relational. It's designed and built to encourage and inspire others to grow in Christ. And so when Paul was writing in the book of Hebrews, I want to extract uh, a portion of that he was writing there about this very concept. So in Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 23, he writes this way. He says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. The hope we profess is the gospel. It's our faith in Jesus Christ for he is faithful. The next verse says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on 
toward love and good deeds. You see, the missional part is happening here. The intentional part is happening here. And it says, it says this. It says, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. In the King James Version, Paul admonished this way. He said, this says not giving up meeting. It says, forsake not the assembling. Paul was saying it's very important that you don't put off the gathering that is so important to your spiritual health. There's something, there's just something about coming together as a community, as a local church, and what it does to us, we're going to dig a little deeper and help us to understand what that is. So when Paul's writing this, let's take a snapshot of what the early church model would have looked like. We talked about this last week as well. And I'm going to take you back to a familiar passage that we read, Acts chapter 2, verse 46. This is talking about the Christ followers. It said, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. And then last week we talked, we highlighted this part. It says, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So let me just help you understand this. They met together in the temple courts. The, in, in that current society, in that snapshot of the Jewish culture of that day, the temple was central to everything they did. So it wasn't just open on Sunday for church. It was open all the time. And so they would come to the temple and offer sacrifices and pray and meet with other people in the temple courts. And they, it says that they were doing this every day. So, so this was very important. And Paul was telling them, don't forsake that gathering. It's very critical. It's important for your spiritual health. It's important to help you encourage other people. So they were doing that. And they're doing it daily. If, we, if you look at our modern culture, our Western culture, we don't have a temple. We don't do it like that. So the closest thing that we have to that kind of understanding would be our local church assembly. And of course, we don't gather here every day, but we do on Sunday. We set that day aside to gather together and we, we do it corporately. And so Paul discusses how important this corporate meeting and gathering is and it's, he, he also demonstrates the purpose of that gathering. And so just unpack a couple of excerpts from that passage again. He said, hold unswervingly to the hope we, we profess. And in the King James, it says it this way, hold fast to the profession of your faith. In other words, if you're a Christ follower and you've accepted him and you are pursuing him and you're, you're, you're allowing the spirit of God to work on you and change you, you've got to hold on to that. And so that, that is part of what we do in our understanding and remembering what the gospel has done to us. And then the other thing that it does is he tells us to, that it encourages each other when we're together. So he says to spur one another on, motivate each other towards love and good deeds. There's an action that's happening when we're gathering together. I got to tell you though, there's no wonder that, that it's easy to not go to church. Okay, I'm a pastor. I'm going to make a plug for coming to church, right? That makes sense. But there's, there's more to it than just, than just that. It, we don't, you know, when life gets busy, sometimes the first thing we want to cut off is, is the things we do in church or, or, you know, I really need my Sunday morning. I'm tired. I've been a busy week. Don't cut those things off just because you're busy. Paul's telling us, he, he wrote way back then that don't forsake or don't don't skip out on meeting together. In fact, do it more because things are progressing. He says, do it more as you see the day approaching. And he's referring here to the return of Christ. But, but he knew, Paul was aware, the spirit was leading him. He had spiritual insight and spiritual wisdom. And he knew that things were gonna get bad before Christ returned. And so he's telling them then, and he didn't know what 2020 was gonna be, but you and I do. And let me just tell you this, don't forsake that gathering together. We've got things keeping us apart and, and we're having to, to have church virtually and, and we're doing our best to stay connected with Zoom and, and whatever we can do. But, but when that lifts or that changes, I hope, that, I hope there's a new motivation in us to be together as a community and to grow together as a community because the power of togetherness that happens in community, it keeps us doing the right thing. It keeps us encouraged. It keeps us fighting the good fight. And so Paul says, when you're together, use that moment to encourage each other to keep doing what they're called to do. So coming to church is important. It's very important. So let's look at what the power of church community actually does. And I'm gonna, several things I'm gonna run through relatively quickly here. Stay with me. 
and we'll get through this with some knowledge and understanding. In Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse number 11, it says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, for verse 12, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. There's a purpose for why we gather together. There's a purpose why Christ established the church. It's so that we could equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up and continue to grow and expand. In verse 13 it says, until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. It's very important what God established here. He established this to help us all grow together in unity. Here we go again. We're fighting division. We're putting aside division. And we're focusing on what God is doing with us better together building unity. Let's look at some reasons. There's strength in numbers. I read this the first week of this uh, series, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A, three, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. In other words, the more there are together, the strength increases significantly. The unity of community creates a force for change. And when you know you're doing the right thing and you get to do the right thing with a group of people that are supporting you, you have the strength and the courage to keep going. Corporate worship. Why is this important and why does it matter? Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 18. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, I've had some amazing God moments in my car with my favorite worship song on repeat. 15 times, 20 times. What? Just looping that song because I'm connecting with it. I'm sensing God's presence. It's awesome. But there is nothing that compares to being in a room filled with people that love Jesus and worship is happening and hands are lifted up and voices are raised and you open your eyes and you look around and sometimes you see tears streaming down people's cheeks or heads bowed and brows furrowed or smiles on their, whatever, but people just engaging as a corporate body, as a unified group, just worshiping together. There is nothing like it. And I'm telling you this, if you haven't been in church in a long time, you owe yourself the opportunity next time churches are open to go and sit in a worship service, stand in a worship service with other people around you and let your voice out as you praise Jesus because there's something amazing about corporate worship as in the church community. The second or the third, whatever number I'm on at this point, don't know, corporate prayer. Powerful, powerful tool when we do this together. I love what James says about it. James chapter five. Is anyone among you tr in trouble? Let him pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Watch verse 15. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up if they have sinned, the sin will be forgiven. Look, there's something powerful. It's been a long time since we've been able to stand in our church and at the end, we would bring our prayer team up at the front and we would invite people to come and together, corporately, we would pray and we would fight hell so that people can stand for truth. And listen, we've had to adjust. You know, we've had to. But I'm believing that that's going to change and we'll be back together. And the joining of faith, praying as, as a community, you cannot, you cannot convince me that God doesn't hear and God doesn't answer. We are seeing those miracles happen even now. Another thing that happens in the local church community is clear direction to the community. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, consequently it says, faith comes by hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Listen, listening to someone preach a message and speak to the corporate body, it builds our faith. It gives us direction. It creates a spiritual covering for us. Yes, you can read your Bible for yourself. You should, you must. The Bible says to seek out 
your own salvation with fear and trembling. But it also tells us that there's something powerful about hearing the message spoken and delivered as guidance and instruction is passed. Our faith begins to grow. It also directly opposes division. And we talked about this in the beginning. I believe we are in a spiritual battle. I believe this with all of my heart. The enemy has a strategic, tactical, offensive weapon, and that is divide and conquer. We see it everywhere all the time. Families are divided. Churches are divided. Uh, people are divided. Uh, communities are divided. Nations are divided. The world is divided. But somehow in all of that, Jesus is saying, I need you guys to come together. We have a common purpose, a common goal. We believe in loving like Christ loves. So we, we're unpacking this. We're fighting against this spirit of division. And we are part of the LC family. You know how families are. I mean, you, you, your family, right? And everybody's got that difficult sibling or that uncle that's crazy or you know you get together and inevitably there's going to be a blow up somebody's going to say something make somebody mad but don't let anybody else talk about your family right because even though there's diversity inside the family there's something that unites it and that is because they're family so this community may have differences and we we may see things different ways but at the end of the day LC community is a family, and we believe that we're called to unite and bring other people into this family because we're focusing on what makes us similar as opposed to what divides us. Better together and together through community. We grow together, and as the scripture we read earlier in Hebrews, it encourages us to keep doing the right thing and doing good. It spurs us on to love like Christ loves us. And I believe that, that the church, there is no place on earth that offers the healing that happens in a church. And the reason why I say that is because there are moments, obviously, I, you guys understand what I'm saying here. God will touch you wherever you are. But there is something so beautiful and so unique when you're gathered together in church. The presence of God is in the room and you're, you're struggling. We read in James how physically you can be healed, but it's more than just physical healing. Sometimes, sometimes your mind is hurting. Sometimes your emotions are broken. Sometimes you're just spiritually weak and there's nothing like being in the presence of God with other believers and his presence is moving. In just a few moments, that healing can begin to take place. And I don't know about you, but, but I want other people to share that that moment and that experience because it is life-changing. It is life-changing. This is a place, the local church is a place, I believe, where you can find fulfillment. So we talked about this also last week, and, and, and I, I got to say, I, there's something about true fulfillment that comes when we're doing what we're created to do. There's a lot of things that can make us happy, and there's a lot of things that we can, you know, get involved in that we enjoy and there's a lot of things that we can find pleasure in but there is nothing that runs as deep and as offers as much fulfillment as when we are doing what we are created and designed to do and i i want you to know that life center it it is our purpose to help people find this because we believe it's what god has called us to do we believe it's what the purpose of the church is and we do four things to help people find that we want people to know jesus we want people to find freedom. We want people to discover their purpose. And we want ultimately those people, once they've discovered their purpose, to make a difference. Every one of those four things builds upon the next. All of it is leading us to a life of true fulfillment when we are doing what God has called us to do. And let me tell you how it is mostly represented. It is generally represented in our service through other people, our service to other people. What God has called us to do is to touch other people. That's why we've been digging through this. That's why we've been looking at Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman at the well, how that was an odd situation, but he was intentional, he was missional, and he was relational, and it caused a change, not just in one person's life, but in many people's life. And so we believe that if you find that path, that true fulfillment begins to come. Jesus said that he came to give abundant life, and this is what abundant life 
looks like. But you may ask, what if, what if I don't know what my purpose or calling is? Or how can I live with purpose if, and have fulfillment if I really don't know what that looks like? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I, I think I may have a solution for you. <laughs> we have something called growth track here. And the whole purpose for that is specifically designed to help you take those steps and begin to understand how God made you what makes you unique and how that uniqueness can be plugged into a specific little space that God has created just for you. The church is designed for a place to serve. I've heard it referred to as a hospital. I kind of think, think of the church, though, as a kitchen, not a restaurant where you're being served, someone else is doing all the work. No, I'm, 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 this is a kitchen, right? Everybody's, we got sous chefs, everybody's doing something, all because we're creating a meal for someone that doesn't know Christ. And so everybody's in there. The church is not a place for you just to come and sit and be fed. No, 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 no. When we work together in that kitchen, we're being nurtured. We're, being, uh, we're, we're finding nutrition. We're feeling fulfillment in our life because we're serving someone else. And by doing so, we are serving our God and our Savior. It was written like this in Acts. I love this. Paul is writing here. He said in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of Jesus himself, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, this is a a bit of a mouthful. And I, I, I really only believe that people that, can truly say this and understand what Jesus was meaning in this context (laughs) was people that have selflessly served another because there is something that happens when you do that that just it does something inside and it changes something inside of you so when when this was written it, it was telling the story that says if you've never experienced what this is like there really is a truth in knowing that it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so as we invest our time, talent, and treasure, you will find that when we do that, it's always in something that we either believe in or something that we place a value on. Most of the time, our family is very important to us. So what do we do? We invest our time, talent, and treasure into our family because we believe in them and we value them. You may have a business and you may invest your time, talent, and treasure in your business because you find value in that business. It means something to you. So I'm asking you this, as part of this this community, as part of LC community, as part of that family, are you investing your time, talent, and treasure in that community? Because as that happens, we begin to understand what it looks like to live a life that is truly blessed and experience abundant life like Jesus talked about. Let's look at time time. We all have the same amount. Nobody has more than anyone else. But how do you invest your time? Well, you can lead or participate in a small group. We talked about that a lot last week. Lead or participate in a small group. Become part of our dream team where you get the opportunity to serve someone that perhaps does not know Jesus like you do. And you, by serving them, could be the person that opens the door for that life-changing experience. You know, your next step there to join the dream team, complete the growth track and we will help you find a place to serve. And when we return here, we're gonna need our dream teamers on point because we have a lot of new things we have to do to keep this place ready for guests and new people that are coming to find Jesus. Talent, same thing, lead or participate in a small group, become part of the dream team. Use, Use that skill, that talent, and apply it to a place in this community that will benefit the the growth of the community and the other people that are associated in part of the community. Of course, treasure. Look, generosity provides the ability for us to fulfill the commission that God left for us and that is to spread the gospel. That's how it happens. Everything we do is about investing in others. Why? Because if we found Jesus, we know him and we found freedom and we've discovered our purpose and we're working to make a difference, then guess what? Somebody else needs to go through that same thing that you did. Someone else needs to know Jesus. Someone else is bound and they need to find freedom. And someone else is living an unfulfilled life because they've never discovered their purpose. And once they do, guess who's going to make a difference? Yep, that person. So we all have a role to play. And I'm going to just wrap it up with this. To snatch back to uh, last week, 
I ended with this, and this was just so amazing to me to see what Jesus did and how he demonstrated this. In John chapter 4, remember, he just had the whole interchange with the woman at the well. That whole miraculous event happened. He had sent the disciples away to get food. They came back with food. And Jesus is telling them, because they're trying to figure out what happened. John chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus explained, My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. Look, once you've experienced what it looks like to really serve selflessly, there is something that happens inside your soul that cannot be filled with food or things or wealth or friends or any of the things that we would normally find some satisfaction. There's nothing that quite touches it. Because when you've done what God has called you to do, you truly get to feel abundant life happening inside of you. So as we close, I want to pray. I think this is probably the final time I'm going to pray this prayer, but I've prayed it every week. I've prayed this scripture. It's the prayer that Jesus prayed over his disciples when he was leaving. And I'm praying that prayer over you and over me today. In John chapter 17, Jesus, what, this is what Jesus prayed. My prayer is not for them alone, talking about the disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's you and me. That all of them may be one father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. I pray that over you right now, wherever you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for walking this journey with us. And if you have missed any of these these uh, sermons for this series, you can always go to our website and find those there. Super easy. And I would encourage you to do that because, again, I say that we are, we're in a struggle. And let's know what the enemy is doing so we can counterattack that. So, that being said, I just want to remind you that this is our last Sunday that we're going to be only virtual. Unless something changes, August 9th will be... Uh, an opportunity for us to come back together. I, I, I'm sure you've seen the closing from the last couple of weeks, but I was talking to Pastor Scott. I was like, I cannot wait until I've been able to stand in a worship service and then get up on the stage to, to preach a message after being part of that instead of doing it solo and so uh, distanced from, from everyone. So I'm excited about this, but there's a couple of things that we have to do in preparation. I want to make sure you're paying attention right now because it's some very important information that I need to pass along. The first thing is this, Wednesday night, next Wednesday night at 7 p.m., all of our dream teamers, I'm calling all of our dream teamers that serve here at LC, regardless of if you're on the schedule for August 9th or not, that doesn't matter, all of our dream teamers that serve at LC, I'm asking you to come to the church Wednesday night at 7 p.m. We are gonna walk through what we will need to do to prepare for our guests that come uh, to church on August the 9th and beyond that. So we're going to follow all the guidelines and there's a lot of little actions we need to do to make sure we're compliant. So uh, please don't forget, mark your calendar. Please be here Wednesday at 7 p.m. so that we can go through that together. It will be great to see all of you. So here is the plan. The plan is there are going to be two service times on August the 9th, and the reason why we're doing two service times is to make sure there's plenty of space. We have to continue with social distancing and not over uh, uh, have more people than the capacity than we should have, all those things. So there's going to be two service times. 9.05 will be the first one, 11.10 will be the second one, and Centro De Vida will meet here at 1.15. So we have three gatherings on a Sunday, August 9th, happening right here, 9.05, 11.10, and Centro de Vida at 115. So I'm going to explain how August 9th is going to work. Uh, for the August 9th event, we are going to set up uh, two Facebook events that will be released on Facebook. And if you're not familiar with how that works, you'll get an announcement on your page that says Life Center is having an event August the 9th at 905. And there'll be another one that says we're having an event at 1110. And so what you're going to do is you're going to pick one of those services. You're going to RSVP by clicking a I'm going button. 
And then when you do that, you need to go into the comments section and you need to use your little thumbs and type in the names of the people that are going to be with you. That way we can make sure that family units have seating arrangements. We know how many people are coming so that we have enough space. If we have, happen to have a, a walk up or a guest that just stops by, we'll be able to, to manage that. We don't wanna have to turn anybody away just because we're full. So we're trying to get a step ahead of that. So all of our Life Center uh, family, please be responsive and, and do this so that you can help us manage uh, the folks that are gonna be coming in. So a couple of other things related to August 9th, we will not be offering Life Kids. Uh, we're not gonna have Life Kids and we won't be doing coffee and refreshments in the foyer like we had normally done. M probably won't do those things until stage three happens and then we'll follow those guidelines to make sure our kids are safe and everybody is safe. As you may know or may not know, as of Friday at 5 p.m., the governor and county executive mandated that my masks must be worn by everyone, and specifically in Baltimore County, age two and above. So when you come to church, make sure you bring a mask with you, and your little tyke has a mask as well, and we do have some spares that we can uh, give you if you happen to forget it. I, I can't tell you how many times I've been wearing a mask now for weeks. I pull up to the store, I'm halfway to the store before I realize I forgot my mask in the car. It's just a thing. It takes me two trips to the car to get to the store one time, because <laughs> forget the mask. So. Please bring your mask. We'll have one if you don't have one available. We're going to look. We're going to do our best to follow the guidelines. It's very, it's complicated and seems to change all the time, but we're going to do our best to follow the guidelines that are established by our local authorities because our goal is we want you safe. Nobody wants to know that you got COVID from coming to church, right? So we're going to make sure that we do everything we can, and that's why our dream teamers are going to shine like the rising sun. We're going to need you guys here to help us Make sure this is, this is a great place. The Dream Team is going to be working before and after each, of, each gathering to make sure things are sprayed and wiped down and sanitized. So this also, we're going to have, have to have your help as well. When you come in, we have service and service is over. Uh, we got to move everybody out the door quickly so that we can get everything ready for the 1105 um, for the people that are coming to that. So it's going to be interesting. It's going to be, we're going to make it fun. Uh, I would just encourage you. I mean, I mean, this is about the hugginess church I've ever been to, but we got to do air hugs and air high fives and, and all that fun stuff, you know, to make this enjoyable. So, so please pay attention to Facebook, your email, any of those things that we normally use to try to communicate the information to you. I'm very, very excited about the possibility of seeing everyone on August the 9th. So we don't really know how it's all gonna work exactly. We think we have a good plan in place. We're asking you to help us. And if we do, it should go off very smoothly and we should be able to get to, to enjoy worshiping together finally in our local community. So I love you all. Thank you for being here today. God bless you.